This podcast is being brought to you by Zola, the wedding company that will do anything for love, is reinventing the wedding planning and registry experience to make the happiest moments in couples' lives even happier. Join over 500,000 couples who've used Zola. Zola takes the stress out of wedding planning with free wedding websites, save the dates and invitations, a wedding registry, and free easy-to-use wedding planning tools. It's so convenient to manage everything online in one place, and it saves so much time for the couples. They have over a hundred beautiful save the dates and invitation designs. There's really one for every style and color scheme. So it's easy to customize Zola's designs with photos, your own wording. You even get your free guest addressing, free matching envelopes, and friendly prices. They have free wedding websites that actually match all of the save the dates and invitations. And you can add your guests to Zola's tool and they'll help you collect missing addresses, format your addresses, and even track RSVPs, which is amazing. My favorite part about Zola is the free wedding website. It's easy to personalize your favorite design with all of your wedding details, your photos, stories, travel, accommodations, and you can even integrate your wedding registry with Zola so that your guests can get all the details they need to buy a wedding gift in one convenient place. The Zola store has the widest selection of gifts, all different prices, over 500 top brands such as KitchenAid, Sonos, Airbnb, and you can even create a honeymoon fund at Zola and register for travel gift cards from like Delta and Southwest, which is amazing. If you do your registry through Zola, you get 20% off remaining gifts on your registry for six months post-wedding, which is amazing. So go on over to Zola.com slash Angela Profit and get 30% off your save the dates and invitation order. That's Z-O-L-A dot com slash Angela Profit, P-R-O-F-F-I-T-T, two F's and two T's. Welcome to Weddings Unveiled, the podcast designed to help you build a productive, profitable wedding or event business. Here's your host, Angela Profit. Hi, y'all. It's Angela Profit, your event and productivity therapist, coming to you from the heart of Music City in Nashville, Tennessee. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Weddings Unveiled, professional tips and secrets on wedding planning and event design, where we take you behind the scenes of our past experiences in the event industry, what we have learned from them, and how they have made us stronger. This podcast will help you grow a productive and profitable business to launch you into success within the hospitality industry. Hi, y'all. It's Angela Prophet. Welcome back to Weddings Unveiled. And today I'm so excited to talk with my friend, Reverend Clint Huff. I've known Clint for a couple of years. I was actually a guest on his podcast, one of his podcasts, and also ran into him at Wedding MBA recently. And I would say he's pretty well known from doing the very first Bachelorette. You all know that show, even if you don't watch TV. Trista and Ryan, back from the Bachelorette 2003, Reverend Clint Huff actually married them. And I don't think that we'll ever forget that, even though it seems like it was so long ago. I feel like I remember it since yesterday. So Clint, welcome. Thank you for joining me today. Oh, Angela, thank you so much. This is really an honor for me. Thank you. You're so welcome. Well, let's jump in. And for my audience who they don't know a lot about what you do, can you just tell us about your background? Well, those are two separate questions. What I do is I'm a non-denominational wedding officiant and a public speaker, master of ceremonies and an auctioneer. And my background or how I got into the industry is through entertainment. I've done just about everything that you <laughs> I've been in front of the camera and behind the camera and stage and commercials and movies and television. And I've done all of that kind of stuff. And one of the things I did for a long time, I was a disc jockey. I did radio. I did clubs for 15 years. I did a lot of social events, including weddings. And I realized that it was time for me to take a different path. And so 
I don't know, about 24 years ago, I got ordained as a non-denominational officiant with the intent of helping people celebrate things, whether it be a wedding or a baby or to celebrate a life. And I've been doing it ever since. And it's I'll be honest with you, wedding officiating is the best job I've ever had in my entire life. And I don't think I'm ever going to stop doing it. It's just incredible. Isn't it amazing like to be part of all of these special events and how it's like people never, they'll never forget you because of all the special moments that you did all of these things. And it's great. I can tell you're a DJ dude because you have such a great voice, (laughs) which is awesome. How did you like specifically get into like the wedding industry? Like we all remember our first time, I think. As a DJ, when I got out of nightclubs and then I did some other things, a friend of mine told me about a a company that did entertainment, DJs and and master of ceremonies for weddings and events and that sort of thing. And I went to work because of all my experience as a a speaker and a master of ceremonies and a DJ and, you know, both in, in the nightclubs and also on the corporate level. It just seemed like a natural fit something that I could easily adjust to. And so that company did a lot of weddings and that's how I got into the business. And I also, they had a video division. So not only was I able to work as an entertainer for weddings, but I also edited a lot of wedding videos back in the day when everything was still on uh, videotape. And that right there is probably the best training ground possible for being an officiant because I'd be all by myself in the editing room and piecing together somebody's event And there were so many times when I was watching a wedding ceremony where I thought to myself, what are you talking about? What does that have to do with them? I don't get that. And so when the opportunity presented itself for me to be an officiant, I knew that I was going to take a completely different approach. And so that's what I've done. I make sure that the couple is in control, that the couple is guided by me, but I give them a ton of resources and they actually create their own ceremony because I tell every single couple, this is really important. It's your wedding. You should say exactly what you want to say and you should hear exactly what you want to hear. Because I would say 90% of the horror stories that we hear about wedding ceremonies have to do with getting caught completely by surprise by the officiant or somebody else who's participating doing something that wasn't anticipated and it's absolutely inappropriate or wrong or embarrassing or, or whatever. And I got stories I can tell you for a long time about what I've seen. But So I thought that my approach would be different and guarantee me, and I'll be honest with you, it was a very selfish approach because I didn't want to be the person who made the mistake. I didn't want to be the person who was responsible for any embarrassing memories. I wanted every memory to be brilliant. And so I thought, well, if I put them in control and get a real strong sense of exactly what they need based on what they want to say and hear, then because of my experience with live productions and you know, all that kind of background. I understand all the elements that go into a wedding ceremony that have nothing to do with the words. They have to do with the logistics and the people. And I was able to kind of look out for every couple over the last 20 plus years from that standpoint as well. And it's been fantastic. Gosh, it's so true. Like you can have the most amazing officiant and then if the sound doesn't work or there's feedback or interference with the microphones and the string trio or whoever's playing the live music, like the logistics is so important. And so whenever I work, you know, with with all these different officiants, you know, that's one thing as a planner that we, I would say half and half drive, like half of our clients come in and they say, our friend's going to marry us or someone that's very special to us is going to marry us. And I really love that. And then other times people say, well, we don't really know anybody, but like, we'd like to get to know somebody. So based on their experience, you know, we have lots of people that officiate ceremonies, but we try to match that personality with the person that we carry it out. But sometimes when I work with officiants that I've never worked with before and the bride and groom are like, oh, it's my friend. They got ordained online. And so then I'm like, so are you going to come to rehearsal? And most officiants who know what they're doing, they don't need to come to rehearsal. But if they've never done it before, I'd really like them to come to rehearsal. And so I've gotten to the point to where like, it's not a question anymore. It's like, okay, so rehearsal is at 530. Please be there at five. We're going to do a sound check. And then the ones that say to me, why do we need a sound check? I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ. Like, I just don't even know how this is going to go. 
it's like they, they know nothing about logistics. And so I've even have had people before where like young officiants or it's their first time. I don't know what it is, but lately here I get a lot of first timers and I'm like, how is this? I've been doing this for so long. And so I'm like, turn your mic on, like make sure you turn your mic on. And so I've had to go up like in just, you know, put my hands in front, like waving and like jump up and down and say, turn your mic on and like start over. Basically. I even had one guy recently and it's so funny because his background was in television as well. He's a comedian and he was so nervous. He's like, I don't have a teleprompter. I mean, these are my friends. I know all 300 people in the audience. I'm like, dude, do you need a volume? Like chill out, like just talk. (laughs) Like, you have a script in front of you. I gave him my iPad and I just couldn't believe how he just didn't know how to be on when he was off like camera. But anyway, I would love for you to share with us like what's one of the craziest stories that you've encountered when like things were not in your control. Well, let me go back real quickly to the key officiant. You know, what's interesting is that I learned this as a disc jockey. When you play music, it comes from a source, whether it be a laptop or CDs or back in the day, it was all vinyl, whatever. It comes from a source and then it goes through a bunch of equipment and then it comes out through the speakers. In radio, it came out through the speakers of people's cars or wherever they were listening to the radio. In nightclubs, it came out through the speakers that were in the club. In the mobile universe, it comes out through the speakers that are near the dance floor. And even though the knobs and the and all that kind of stuff are basically the same, the difference between each environment is night and day. I know how to make music come out of equipment, but then do I know how to work within that environment? Radio is completely different. And within radio, each kind of format is its own thing. Nightclubs are completely different. And within that world, each nightclub is different. And then events are different. And as you know, better than anybody, Angela, each event has its own personality. And so when you take somebody out of their element, whether it be in front of a camera, on television, working with a teleprompter, being a comedian, whatever, and you put them into an environment where we say, you're still going to talk, you're still going to be in front of people and you're still going to talk, but it's completely foreign to what you've been used to doing. I cut those people a lot of slack. However, I think that there's a there's a couple of things that that will help people a lot. Uh, one of the podcasts that I co-host is the Wedding Ceremony Podcast, and my partner J.P. Reynolds has written a book, How to Officiate a Non-Denominational Wedding, that is uh, selling really well in Amazon. You can get the hard copy or you can get the digital version, and I think that is a must for anybody that's going to be officiating for the very first time because it's the things that go wrong you'll remember. And you don't want to be the person because Angela, you know this better than anybody. The a wedding a wedding day is a long day. I explain this to every couple, especially if it's a bride and a groom. I'll say to the groom, you need to wrap your mind around this concept. This day is going to be a really long day for her. Be, I mean, from the time she starts doing her hair and makeup to the time you're waving goodbye to everybody, it's like 10, 12 hours. It is a long day. And here we have this little sliver of time in the middle of this big, long day. And that little sliver of time is the wedding ceremony. The thing that's interesting is that wedding ceremony carries more emotional content than almost anything you're going to do the rest of the day. And that's why it should be perfect. And so perfect is subjective. I mean, that means different things to different people. But that connection between the couple, that is actually what drives everything that I do. That connection between the two of them. And guys are really visual. The important moments in our life, we can play back the movie in full color. And we're also really simple. I mean, And because we're kind of simple, I mean, you know, we know what we like, we know what we don't like. I think what we feel is actually almost overwhelming because there's nothing that gets in the way of it. It's just we feel what we feel. When we fall in love, it's crazy. And when you realize, oh my gosh, this is the person I want to be married to, then asking that person is kind of the scariest thing we've ever done. Because all we want is for this person that we love this much to be really happy and to be happy being with us. I mean, I'll be honest with you. With my wife, I'm amazed she still wants to hang around with me, much less marry me. And so, <laughs> and every couple, every time I say this, that when I meet a couple, when I explain to the bride what a guy's going through, he's all, I said, I always say, okay, I'm about to say a bunch of stuff. Now you correct me if I'm wrong. They never do. And they're always nodding their head when I explain to the bride what a guy is going through. And so that look in her eyes that during the ceremony, when he actually realizes, oh my gosh, Oh my gosh, this is it. This is the moment. She's becoming my wife. He's in, this is what's going on inside him. 
And all he wants at that moment is the greatest gift that anybody could give a groom on his wedding day. And it's really simple. It's that his fiance, soon to be spouse, has that look in their eye that they are, number one, the happiest person on the face of the earth. Number two, there's nothing else on their mind. Everything's been figured out. Everything. Every little tiny little detail that's connected to the ceremony has been figured out by the people that they trust, wedding professionals, or in this case, the officiant, you know, who they've chosen because they have a personal emotional connection to this person. They trust that this is all going to be great. And, and he can see that she's where she wants to be. She's doing what she wants to do. And she still wants to marry him. And, and that's what he's going to remember for the rest of his life is that look in her eyes. So my job as an officiant is to, I always think of them as being in my bubble, to kind of look out for every little tiny thing that's going to be involved in the ceremony. If there's going to be a reader, then I want to make sure I know where they're sitting and I'll suggest that they sit on the edge of the the aisle, whether on the middle or on the end, so that there's not a big deal of them trying to get where they need to go. If they're using my microphone, I adjust the height for them. I go, um, I always have a printout of the, of the, whatever they're reading just in case. And, and then I always look at the environment, what we're standing on, where we are, what noises are there, who's there. And I mean, when you ask about embarrassing moments, my gosh, you know, just pick a category and it's happened. After 20 years, you know, it's people have fainted, people, um, I mean, in the wedding party, in the front row, there's been flybys of low aircraft where we got to wait. There have been dropped rings. There's been elements that were forgotten that we, you know, just, and you just have to kind of stay ahead of the game and, and make sure that no matter what, they're going to get married and they're going to be really happy. And, and that preventive medicine, that, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Oh my gosh, you multiply yep. that by a thousand when it comes to a wedding ceremony. And so that's my job. At least that's, that's what I think my job is, is to look ahead and make sure that everything that is important has been taken care of. And you know what, Angela, 80% of that, I never tell the couple because it's, I mean, they don't need. That's awesome. You know, I just, if it's something that like you as the coordinator, if it's something that you need to be aware of, that we need a thing, we need a person, we need a whatever, then I will contact you separately and say they're thinking of doing this or this is part of their ceremony. And the week of the wedding, I email the coordinator the actual ceremony in its entirety along with any in uh, logistical notes that are relevant to that person. Because I just, I think, you know, the more we plan, the better it's going to be. And it's, and a lot of that comes from being slapped in the face a few times, not literally, but by, by something that's gone wrong, you know, and, and that's what it takes. You got to have your war wounds in order to understand how to kind of protect everybody. Yeah. And I've also learned and observed over time that no matter, I mean, it definitely, I feel like for something to go off so perfectly the back end of planning the logistics and everybody communicating really does equal success. And I feel like there are, like you just mentioned, those times where you're doing an outdoor wedding and a plane flies by or a train goes by and having someone up there who enjoys speaking in front of people and who you're comfortable speaking in front of people because it's all in how you handle it. And some people have just had them like freeze up and then other people, they make jokes about it and they have a really good personality. So that's really important. I think it's like, how do you handle the unknown? Because sometimes that's what happens and, and you don't even know how you're going to react sometimes. But if you know that you can react in a positive way, in a funny way, we can usually recover from it. Um, So that kind of leads me to my next question. Like, what would you say the couples that you marry? Like, I I mean, I know you said in in terms of like being special and unique, you make it all about them. Um, Can you share with us something that like feedback from your clients where they're like, oh my gosh, this was awesome or this was different? So the feedback that I get from my couples that, well, first of all, the way I get feedback is I after the ceremony, I email them and say, thank you. Thank you very much for letting me be your officiant. Uh, it was fantastic. And then I'll always identify certain elements of their ceremony that I thought were cool. And then they in kind will respond. And then that's where I get my feedback where they'll say, thank you. And then they'll, they'll inevitably say something, um, that will be specific. And the thing that I keep getting over and over again is you made us feel so calm 
because they're not public speakers, generally speaking, and they're nervous being in front of all these people. I hear that at least half of my couples say we really don't like being the center of attention. And so to have somebody like me take care of them and let them enjoy the moment and be calm and look out for them, uh, knowing that that's part of their personality, um, then, I don't know, that's, that's, I think, the key thing. I mean, there's so many, that's like the word, it's like the umbrella term and all of the things underneath that, that create that kind of environment for them is really like one of the joyful things for me. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. I mean, you've been doing this for such a long time, but do you still incur any challenges like with the wedding industry and how things (laughs) change? Like what can you say are some of your biggest challenges? (laughs) <laughs> oh my gosh, Angela, you know this. Every <laughs> wedding is different. Well, okay, let me put it in context. Okay, I mentioned one of my podcasts, the Wedding Ceremony Podcast. We just recorded, well, today we're going to record episode number 196. Oh, wow. And both of us have been uh, officiants in the wedding industry for over 20 years each. We come from completely different backgrounds. But the thing is, when we first started, I wonder if we're ever going to run out of things to say. And we never do because. Every single wedding has its own personality and idiosyncrasies. And it's amazing the things that, I don't know, the things that keep popping up. Uh, As JP says, my partner on the podcast says, uh, it's a wackadoo world, this world of weddings. And, and it's absolutely true. We, every single wedding, we, we see something that we can say, oh my gosh, I can't, you know, did you see that? Or I did this or whatever it was. We, it just never stops. And I think that's part of the delight of it, of, you know, that every wedding has its own freshness, its own uniqueness. Now, now uh, I mentioned that the way I construct a ceremony is the couple actually builds it, which means I've never done the same ceremony twice. So I have that added bonus as opposed to an officiant that kind of like has their ceremony and they do the same thing every time. Um, the fact that every wedding for me is a brand new, unique text uh, gives it that, uh, that extra zing for me. Uh, I mean, there are certain elements that will be repeated, but the fact that it is one of a kind, I think also is uh, a wonderful, wonderful thing for me to experience. Yeah. I mean, have you, so recently for us, like a challenge that came up with an officiant who is super productive and he's paperless and he shows up with his iPad to do the ceremony. We've worked with him a ton and he's like, Ange, do you have a charger? Because my iPad's dying. And I'm like, oh gosh, like, um, what version is it? And I'm like, I don't have a charger for that one. And he's like, well, can I use yours or can we airdrop the, the ceremony over? And at the time, there was a horrible storm the night before and all the internet was out. And so we couldn't pull down some of our stuff from the cloud. I mean, we managed, he ended up using my iPad and we managed to pull it up. And like you were saying earlier, it's so important to like share the ceremony, like with somebody else, just in case. Absolutely. Uh, So I can tell you like having the internet and then trying to, you know, be up in this day and age can be challenging. But when you officiate ceremonies, do you use technology or do you do it? the safe way, (laughs) which is hold a Bible or something like that. I have every, because every ceremony is unique. I have to print it out. I have to. Um, And I, back when, I mean, I've been kind of a, kind of a tech geek for a while. I mean, ever well, for a long time. And so, uh, but the one thing that I noticed is I didn't want the tech to draw attention or get in the way. And so I know officiants that will do ceremonies off of a tablet or their phone. And I always thought that that's bringing attention to the wrong thing because I, gotcha. I, while I play a critical role in, in the process of the ceremony, taking it from, from beginning to end, I, I'm well aware that as much as I can make it not about me and completely about the couple and their loved ones, then I really have accomplished my primary goal, which is to nothing gets in the way. And, and it's interesting because a lot of couples will make decisions based on what they think the guests are going to think. And so that's why huh. I didn't want the, the tablet or the technology to be distracting the guests. I want the guests, uh, listen, I'll be honest with you, Angela. In my opinion, they're just lucky they got invited. You know what I mean? The ceremony doesn't have anything yeah. to do with them. But some couples will take on that, that pressure. 
they'll start doing, making decisions based on what they think other people are going to think. And so by allowing, giving them the freedom and the security and that safe place to find the words exactly that they want. I, I also suggest, imagine that there was nobody else there, that it was just the two of you. What would you say to each other at that moment? If this was the real deal of you actually getting married at this moment and there was nobody else around, what would you say? And to have that anchor, that emotional anchor that allows the rest of the world to kind of fade away and bring that authenticity to between the two of them. And I explained to them, believe it or not, that's what your guests want. The guests don't want a performance. The guests want to watch something that is romantic and authentic and overwhelmingly emotional. That's what they want. They want to believe in the two of you. And so uh, in order to make sure that nothing breaks that concentration and that authenticity, I print out everything and I have it right in front of me. And I also have heard so many, way too many times how the officiant will say the wrong names or mispronounce a name. And so uh, in order to protect them and protect my, my craft, then that's why I have everything printed out. But I also, along those same lines, <laughs> I, I don't know if I should be embarrassed about this or not, but I have cell phones, but I also have a landline just in case. And, gotcha. and so if I know that there's a possibility that I'm going to show up and things just, something could get in the way, whether it be weather or technology or whatever, then I want to have plan B and plan C for all of that. And so when I email the coordinator, the ceremony, that is, not only do I have a backup because they're probably going to print it out and bring it just as their backup. I mean, I'm fortunate that I work with great, great wedding professionals if I was you know, just beginning and was going into the entry market, then I couldn't really trust that everybody knew what they were supposed to do. But at this level, everybody has been in, in the game for a long time and they have established a, a credibility and an authenticity to their professionalism. And so I know that they're going to bring it, but also I have the email. And so the attachment mm -hmm. of the email is, is like plan C but uh, I've never had to do that. So talking about performances and going back to Trista and Ryan and filming for television, I think that you and I both know kind of how TV operates and so forth. But for our listeners that don't have the experience with being on set and things like that, is there anything that you can share from doing Trista and Ryan's wedding and how it was televised and do you feel like those audience slash guests still felt like it was that emotional experience, even though it was being televised? <laughs> well, yeah, I think it works from the inside out. I mean, yes, I have a lot of experience and I understand the logistics of a television um, production. And I, I've, you know, I've been in that world for uh, my entire adult life. So I understand all the different pieces. There was this wonder, wonderful moment of clarity where somebody on the production team said something and I said, oh, oh my gosh, I don't have to think about that anymore, do I? Because you guys are taking care of all that stuff, aren't you? And she said, well, yes, we are. Because, you know, when we're in weddings, then, you know, you are, as the coordinator, you are the, the director, I guess, or the producer or whatever it is. And then we all play our different parts. And, and so there's a lot of things that we have to do almost on a grassroots level, bootstrapping level, where we have to make sure that everything um, moves forward and does so uh, seamlessly. But in a television production, and then it also depends on the size of the production, that was a full network production. And so it was a, you know, a $4 million wedding just in the components of the wedding itself. But it was a multi-million dollar production in terms of the crew and, and everything that went into it. So there were a lot of things that I didn't have to think about. But what makes great television is uh, real human emotion. And so Tristan and Ryan went through the exact same process that I, I do with every couple. They, uh, I mean, the difference was that we were emailing stuff back and forth and I interviewed or I talked to her while she was in New York getting her hair done and I was in Los Angeles. <laughs> but other than that, other than that, the process was exactly the same. So they had that confidence that the language is going to be exactly what they want. And so, um, that's, I think, if somebody has never been in that environment and they walk in, just understand that everybody there wants you to succeed. And number two, if you're doing, a, if it's a wedding situation, then the authenticity and the magic of what's happening between the couple is the only thing that you need to really focus on. You don't need to worry about your performance. You just need to be able to provide a world in which the two of them fall in love all over again and become uh, married to each other. And then, believe it or not, that's all the audience wants. So 
from that standpoint, it's the same as any other wedding. You want everybody to feel engaged and like they're a part of this magic that's happening. Uh, because Angela, it's just part of being a human being. I mean, all the things that we have read and listened to in music and watched in, in, on screen uh, or on stage about people falling in love and dedicating themselves to each other, oh my gosh, that never gets old. And if you can give them an environment in which that holds true, it doesn't make any difference what the trappings are. It still is the best of all possible experiences. Yeah, that's awesome. That's so cool. So where can our listeners find out more about you? Because earlier you were telling me that you have several different podcasts. And so I just want to make sure that our listeners know where they can connect and listen and continue listening to all the stories that you have to share. <laughs> You're so kind. Well, there's three <laughs> different podcasts, um, the Wedding Ceremony Podcast, uh, and all of these podcasts are in the iTunes store. The Wedding Ceremony Podcast, we also have a, uh, a website for that. It's WeddingCeremonyPodcast.com. So uh, you can listen to all the episodes there, uh, or you can subscribe in the iTunes store. The Wedding MBA podcast is in the iTunes store, and that's brilliant if you're in the wedding industry. Um, all the people that speak at the Wedding MBA, all their expertise and their brilliant advice. We've done 75 episodes, and those are all in the iTunes store, Wedding MBA podcast. The newest one is the Mitzvah Party podcast for um, bar and bat mitzvah parties. I work with a, a guy who's been in the entertainment industry from that perspective for over 20 years, and oh my gosh. The same amount of stories that we tell about what happens at weddings, we have that exact same amount of stories of what happens at mitzvah parties. And so those are the three podcasts. If you want to reach out to me directly, it's really simple. Just go to reverendclint.com and, or you can email me at revhuft at mac.com. All of that is on the website, reverendclint.com. And, and any way that I can be of help, then it is my honor to serve. Awesome. What's the next best thing coming up for you? Would you say your next big project is the Mitzvah Party podcast or do you have other big projects coming up that you can share with us? Yeah, we're I'm working with some people at an ad agency out of Columbus, Ohio, and they have exclusive rights with the board game. Are you familiar with the board game Monopoly, Angela? Of course. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of people don't know this, but there's a lot of different versions of the board game. Uh, it's still the basic Monopoly game, but there's a lot of different versions. There's versions for firemen and there's versions for, I don't know. The, anyway, so we're developing the wedding edition of Monopoly and we're really excited about this. It's going to be a board game. And instead of the properties for like Boardwalk and Park Place and that kind of thing, we're going to have the best wedding venues across the United States that will be the properties and then the best wedding service providers will be like the railroads and luxury tax. In fact, the celebrity wedding coordinator, Mindy Weiss, is already on the board. Uh, she has the luxury tax uh, space. And then we're putting together, yeah, I, I mean, it. it's going to be incredible. And we're developing, well, that's in development right now. We finally went live with WeddingMonopoly.com. And anybody that has any questions about that, they can reach us through that website, WeddingMonopoly.com. That's the next biggest project, and I'm really excited about that. We hope to get it to market in time for Valentine's Day 2019. That's amazing. Well, I would love to know more about that in the future. We'll have to do this again, and you'll okay. have to talk about Wedding Monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Clint, for being on Weddings Unveiled today, and I hope that you guys have a great day. Bye. If you found this podcast helpful, please share it with other wedding and event professionals. Thank you so much for listening. Be sure to tune in next week for more tips on how to grow your business. And if you have a question or an unresolved issue that you want guidance on, connect with us on AngelaProfit.com. For more valuable resources, again, visit the website. And until next time, remember to stay productive and profitable. You've been listening to Weddings Unveiled with Angela Profit. Join us next time for more insights to help you build a productive, profitable wedding or event business. For more great resources, head over to AngelaProfit.com.